This hour is going to be unique. We are going to talk to someone for the first time on this program. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe years and years ago. Too many years to remember now. But back with us for this hour is without question one of the world's most famous and remarkable Egyptologists. Uh, he is a, an author, lecturer, a guide, a researcher. He is John Anthony West. Uh, this is the man whom some of you will remember if you're, well, if you're fans of ancient Egypt and the Giza Plateau and the Sphinx and the pyramids, who really delivered a tremendous shock to archaeology back in the early 90s when he and Boston University geologist Robert Schock revealed that the Great Sphinx of Giza showed clear evidence of rainfall erosion. And that erosion could only mean one thing, that the Sphinx was carved during or before the rains that marked the transition of North Africa from the last Ice Age to the present interglacial epoch, a transition that occurred in the millennia from 10,000 to 5,000 B.C. B.C. 10,000 B.C. Okay, and that tells us an awful lot. It tells us, and the, the quote here from John Anthony West sums it up. He says, Egyptian civilization was not a development. It was a legacy. In other words, modern ancient Egyptians inherited, found, came by, were gifted, or otherwise did come into possession of technology and monuments that they didn't build like the Sphinx. Uh, this is an extraordinary field, and John Anthony West is uh, is one of the greats of our time. Uh, I don't know, John, if you've been on the program before. I can't remember. It's too many years, 22 years on the air yeah, here. Yeah, you must be getting old. Yeah, I was on the program at least once, maybe a couple of times. Oh, yes. Now, now, I hear your voice. I remember. It, it's been 15 years easy, but you were on a couple of maybe. times. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was a while. I've been at this a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, what, 29, 30 now, 31, something like that. Oh, He's, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm verging on 32. Just yeah. a kid. Now you get to 39, you stop, like Jack Benny. No, did. 32, I was born. <laughs> uh, listen, it's great to have you back on the program. And I, I know uh, that there is so much that we won't even be able to even mention. But what are some of the things that you'd like to put on the table tonight to help people understand that the heritage that they are commonly told is two, 3,000 years old is ancient, way back? What is it that you'd like to say? And then we'll talk about contact in the desert as well as we, as we go ahead. Sure. Well, really, in, in one sense, because, you know, I've been at this a long time, sometimes I talk about my work at a party or I meet new people, and they say, well, what, who cares? What's the difference if the Sphinx is much, much older? And why is that of any consequence? Boy, when you hear that What's kind of a question, do you, do you yeah. walk away? When you <laughs> no, 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 because actually it's a, it's a valid enough question. It is one. It is. It, I mean, it's, these sort of things go on all the time. They're academic quibbles. Yeah. But in this case, th there's a lot more at stake because if the Sphinx is as old as we contend that it is, and I should say here that this is not my original idea, the my work, my Egypt work anyway, because I, I wear a number of hats, and the scholarly hat, my or my Egyptological fist helmet, was not my original hat. I started out, um, I should say, I was never a kind of a, a prodigy, you know, one of these tiresome kids that plays the piano standing on their head mm -hmm. while they're eating an ice cream cone at the mm -hmm. age of four. I was never one of those. Um, but I think I was perhaps psychologically precocious because I knew at the age of 13 or so that I'd been born into a lunatic asylum. Uh -huh. And yeah, hadn't gotten any better either. I'd only been um, uh, fortified mm -hmm. over, the, over the last six or seven decades. And then over the course of much time, much, uh, can't cut into it here, I gradually became aware that it hadn't always been a lunatic asylum, that sane people had existed on the face of this earth. But it wasn't until I was I was starting getting published. I had no intention of becoming a scholar. I'm a scholar mm -hmm. by default. I was, mm -hmm. I'm a novelist, playwright.
playwright, screenwriter, um, short story writer, essayist, all of those things I was doing, getting things published and produced, never making any money, probably. Had I been making money, I wouldn't have gone into the scholarship. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, gradually, gradually, I, I, I came across the kind of work I wasn't even actually seeking. It, it came my way, I suppose, because I was open to it. Mm-hmm. And I came across, first across the, the Gurdjieff work, and that really interested me a lot and still does. And that led me to, I started writing, I wrote my first nonfiction book, which is called The Case for Astrology. It was exactly what it said, what its title says. It is, the, it puts together the evidence, some of it, some of it direct, more of it indirect, that says there is something to it, not that astrology necessarily tells you what's a good day to buy a poodle, but that there is a correlation or a correspondence. You're you're 100 percent right. Uh, you've you your book was a seminal book in in the idea realm of bringing people to the doorstep of considering the fact that there is something to astrology. Now right. I've I've been saying that for for decades. There is yeah. something to astrology. It's like a weather forecast. You can still walk across the street, but it'd be nice to know if it's going to be sunny, hot, cold, rainy, windy. Right. Uh, that's that's the the length of it. Free will dominates. I mean, sheer force of free will is going to dominate. But you can use astrology to your your eminent betterment if you know what you're doing. Yes, you can do that. Any anyhow, that through another series of weird coincidences led me to the work of the the great French genius with the unpronounceable name R. A. Swallows Lubitsch, and uh, I was living in England at that time, involved in, in, in a Gurdjieff group, and I, having, having, having written my, that first nonfiction book, The Case of Astrology, uh, in doing that research, I came across Schwaller's work, which was completely unknown to the English-speaking world at that time. And my French at that time was pretty entry-level, but uh, when I discovered it, when I found out about his work, I, I was living way the opposite, total opposite end of London to the Brooklyn, to the British Museum, mm-hmm. like living in Coney Island and trying to get into the New York Public Library. But I came across this book, and I realized another sort of a little mini epiphany that this was a work of immense importance, even though my French was then entry level. And so I went across one, and I couldn't get a copy of the book without a French. And I, I drove, I took the, sub, the, the tube subway mm-hmm. across London every every morning for about ten months, fighting my way through this impenetrable book with a library, with a dictionary by my side, and eventually ended up with a long chapter devoted to Schwaller's uh, reinterpretation of Egypt, which is called by both adherents and and detractors as the symbolist view of Egyptology, which in a nutshell, proves through absolutely magisterial and incontestable scholarship that the the, the academics, who I like to call the quackademics, no, um, I, I like have that. it have it all wrong. Mm-hmm. And Egypt is not a sort of a dry run for Greece where civilization starts. It is actually a much higher level of civilization that is based upon. A, a sacred science, that is to say, a science of cosmic principles. And Egypt was, in terms of a philosophy, or let's say a religion, a spiritual discipline, mm-hmm. a, a single issue, which is the immortality of the soul. That's actually what's behind all of the corrupt religions that we have facing us today, except the people who actually claim to be practicing those religions are those least aware of what their own religions involve or or promote. Anyway, I came across Schwaller's work and had a long chapter in the original case for astrology. And then publishers came to me and said, you know, would you do a book on Schwaller? And I said, yeah, you bet. This interested me more, even more than the astrology. Mm-hmm. And in doing the work for that book, was called The Serpent in the Sky, which is still very much in trend. I came across a single line uh, that was in a, in a long chapter talking about 
the chronology of Egypt and the Egyptians themselves believed that their own civilization extended many, many thousands of years back prior to the beginnings of dynastic Egypt, which is the Egypt we're all familiar with. Well, I, now, now, John, John, yes. uh, Zahi Hawass doesn't say that. <laughs> no, well, neither do any of the other. No. <laughs> of the other Egyptologists. No. But for Zahi, without going into a long palaver, because we only have an hour, not two weeks. Um, normally, yeah. in my trip that I lead to Egypt, we have two weeks so I can get into this stuff yeah. in detail. Anyhow, yeah. I actually, believe it or not, I mean, Zahi and I were bitter enemies for many years, but we, we kind of buried the hatchet on a personal level, and as I get on quite well with a personal level, uh-huh. And my conviction is that if I can get, if I can get him in person to the Giza Plateau and show him the evidence that he he hasn't really processed in his own head, and show him how powerful that evidence is, mm-hmm. he could turn. The others won't, but he mm-hmm. could turn, and that would be a very interesting development. We'll see. Well, anyway, that would be. Wow. It would be. But, that would be uh, like I'm taking the. Out hope for that. that would be taking the Anyhow, spots off off a leopard. Well, not, not quite. It's, it's more complicated, and as I said, we don't have time in our hour here. Right. But, but anyhow, Schwaller came up with a single observation that the great strength of Giza had been weathered by water and not by wind and sand. And mm-hmm. I realized when I read that it was a, 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 not the major work of Schwaller's, which is called The Temple of Man. Schwaller is a fairly impenetrable writer as many of the great minds are. They're working at a level that <coughs> ordinary human beings can't get you Can't to. access. And, no, understood. And, and I, yeah. I'm sort of the middleman there. I'm, because I'm a writer by trade, I can, I can make it, insofar as I understand it, comprehensible. Anyway, Brawler came up with his observation that it was water, the drinks were weathered by water and not by wind and sand. And to me, I mean, I reckon that was a real revelation uh, because I realized instantly, because I knew a little bit about Egyptian geology and the general paleoclimatology. Um, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a scientist, but I knew a little bit about that. And I realized that if you can prove the Sphinx has been weathered by water and there hasn't been any water to speak of there since about 10,000 B.C., it would mean that the greatest sculpture on the face of the earth, and almost nobody would disagree with that, was carved at a time when there's not supposed to be any civilization at all. So, anyway, that led to this long, 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 now extending one. I read that maybe 1970, so it's now, what, 40 some odd years that I've been chasing this down. And a long series of meeting with people and meeting with geologists and finally finding Robert Chalk, my, my colleague in this, who was uh-huh. a, a, a highly credentialed geologist, uh, Yale PhD in geology, paleontology, and geoarchaea and uh, geophysics, and got him over to Egypt. And again, more long story, uh, he finally, being, I mean, hyper-cautious, realized that the argument was, was unchallengeable. It had been weathered by water, and it was therefore a lot older than anyone thinks. And this got presented at what's effectively the Super Bowl of Geology, the GSA, uh-huh. Geological Society of America, annual meeting back in 91, and that led again through another series of weird circumstances to the NBC special hosted by Charlton Heston that won me an Emmy, and that was um, one of the most successful documentaries ever shown, actually. It, it certainly was. It's still well worth watching. It's a classic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you can now, actually, you can, now see, you can now get it on Netflix, which you couldn't do for well, a while. Oh, that's time. nice. I watched so, that. You you really turned my head, uh, you know, a good 90 degrees. Uh, I realized then that we were living not only in an insane asylum, but in a world of lies. Nothing mm. was as it seems. The truth is almost invariably hidden. <laughs> 